we are pleased to welcome you in this second session of the MetroLab webinar, Social Infrastructure in the Post-COVID City. I'm Geoffrey Grilloir, an urbanist from ULB, and I'm here today with my colleague Mathieu Berger, sociologist from UC Louvain. You already probably know MetroLab. It is a transdisciplinary laboratory of applied and critical urban research funded by the Brussels Capital Region through its ERDF program, European Regional Development Fund. The dozen of MetroLab researchers question three thematic from a transdisciplinary perspective, urban inclusion, urban ecologies, and urban production. This webinar today on social infrastructure in the post-COVID city is part of the urban inclusion thematic. We have unfolded this thematic since 2015 with MetroLab masterclass and publication, Designing Urban Inclusion. In the conclusion of this publication, my colleague Mathieu, but also Benoit, Louise and Marco, emphasize the role of social infrastructure for urban inclusion and urban hospitality. The current health crisis and the fear of close contact in indoor space, that is entailed, present fundamental challenge for social infrastructure and social life. In order to address these challenges brought by the health crisis, we decided to launch this webinar on social infrastructure in the post-COVID city. What are the practical consequences of the health crisis on social infrastructure, on the public that they host, on the policy that promote them? Does the COVID pandemic herald the major crisis of local community space and social facilities? or even of our larger public interiors? Does it call for a reconsideration of the function, use, design, and layout? The purpose of this seminar is to explore this problem from different disciplinary angles with the help of the best specialists, both analysts and practitioners. Last Tuesday, we had the chance to discuss the challenge facing the civic significance of social infrastructure with Eric Lindenberg, this week, we are very pleased to welcome Mark Pimlot in order to address the question of public interior. My colleague Mathieu will now introduce Mark. Thank you, Geoffrey. Uh, indeed, uh, we're very pleased to host and hear Mark Pimlot today. We have been uh, trying to invite you uh, for a while, but uh, finally we succeeded uh, in having you, so we're very happy. Uh, even though maybe this is not exactly the, the ideal <laughs> condition and situation for a, for a discussion, but still we are very uh, lucky to have you. So um, maybe I, I hope that everybody hears us okay. There is a, a slight uh, background noise because we are in a dense urban area, but uh, I guess this is a, uh, a sign that there is still life out there, so that's 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 good. That's not too bad. Um, so, um, Mark Pimlet uh, is an architectural designer and a professor at TU Delft in the Netherlands. He is the author of uh, The Public Interior as ID and Project, a book released in uh, 2016, and also uh, of an, an many other books, but um, especially a book uh, entitled Without and Within, Essays on Territory and the Interior, uh, published in 2007. Um, this one is particularly beautiful and, and fascinating. Um, he's also a visual artist and uh, a photographer, or at least uh, he practices uh, phot photography, and uh, released uh, a beautiful book uh, called In Passing, uh, a book uh, made uh, from his uh, photograph. Uh, in this webinar on the topic social infrastructure in the COVID city and hopefully the post-COVID city soon, we ask uh, various experts to give us their understanding of the current COVID situation, the way it affects our urban public spaces, the places where we used to meet and get together, and in particular, these indoor public spaces, uh, these public interiors that have all the attention of uh, Mark Pimlet. As you said, Geoffrey, last week we had um, a sociologist, an American sociologist, Eric Leinenberg, who gave us his uh, take on the current situation 
from his work on uh, social infrastructure in the US. Next, we will have uh, urban planners, uh, also a, a philosopher. Um, but today, we will have the perspective an of an architect, which is always, always good when we deal with uh, buildings, I guess. So, um, an architect with a deep knowledge of the, the history uh, of architecture, and, uh, and, and especially uh, American architecture and the American territory, but also uh, an architect with, uh, let's say, a, a phenomenological approach, um, attentive to the kind of experiences and space qualities that are pursued in these uh, public interiors. So, Mark, uh, thank you again. We are going to give you the floor and let you proceed with your lecture, whose title is uh, The Public Interior and Its Purpose uh, Reevaluation. But first, maybe uh, a short question. Uh, why this fascination for uh, the public interior? Why was it so important for you at a certain time in your life to dedicate your, your work and your writing to this, uh, to this issue? Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, thank you for that question. It's a, it's, it's not been exactly a lifelong preoccupation, but I have to say that um, it was a public interior in Montreal, which I experienced in the 1960s, which provoked all sorts of uh, uh, thinking, um, particularly um, from the time I started being a visual artist in the, in the late 1980s. And this was to do with an aura of freedom of movement and action and association that this continuous interior in Montreal connected to the development called Place de Marie seemed to, um, to promise. Um, and I was uh, on the one hand for a kind of nostalgia for the utopian promise of the 1960s and uh, a disappointment about its disappearance. Um, the, this, this interior became emblematic of, of, of a problem, um, one which I found was um, deeply ingrained into the American idea of, um, of making space, which in fact turned out to be one of, um, of coercion um, and, uh, and control. So the space was representative in the sense that it uh, kind of offered a notion of freedom, but this freedom was of course illusory. It was connected to uh, compulsion to work and to consume. So that's where it began. And um, it was reinforced, I suppose, by um, uh, my role at TU Delft, where I was was asked to, to write something about the interior, a theory of the interior. And this is how uh, the first book, Without and Within, appeared. And it ended up becoming a stronger and stronger compulsion, turning my attentions to the European interior thereafter and uh, the forms and articulations of the public interior. So that's that's the short answer to your question. OK, thank you very much. Um, right before you start, uh, I just had a, a quick uh, announcement for our audience. Uh, first, to thank you for uh, staying tuned and for being with us uh, today to hear Mark, uh, Mark's lecture. Um, as you know, if you uh, were there the last week, we will hear uh, the, the, the lecture from our guest uh, for uh, about 45 minutes, 60 minutes maybe. Uh, and then we, Geoffrey and I, we will have uh, a couple of questions, uh, or oral questions. But then we will take uh, as many questions as we, we can from you, uh, the audience. So do not hesitate to uh, post your questions uh, in the chat during Mark Grimlot's talk when some uh, interesting point is raised, you can uh, you can just uh, uh, transmit us uh, your your questions and we will sort them a little bit and uh, and and translate them if they need to and then we will ask them to Mark uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. I can er currently only see four people in the room, so I, I'm hoping that they're out there. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, 29 uh, people. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they are in another room. Let's see the audience. That's far uh, more. Can see them. <laughs> and my desktop, which is very difficult, but um, um, but it's here somewhere. Well, um, we're about 40, 45 people. Okay, but um, um, can you see this? Not yet, no. You should click on the share button within uh, Microsoft Teams. Normally, if you see in the, the lower part. Yes, I see a series of desktop. Oh, here we go. Got it. Right. 
Ah, yeah, perfect. And I will put it uh, full screen then. Oops, oh, I'm at the end of the presentation. I should put it at the beginning. That would help. Um, that would really help. And uh, I'll put it full screen immediately. It's great. great. Can you see that? It's a kind of yes. flashing red lines around it. Well, thank you very much again, Mathieu and Benoit Sarah, for your <laughs> technical uh, uh, interventions. Uh, uh, Geoffrey and uh, Louise and all of you at Metwell and Brussels for offering me the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon on the theme of uh, social infrastructure in the post-COVID city. And of particular concern to me, the matter of the public interior. It is probably necessary to establish here what the public interior is or might be before we begin to discuss a condition that is post-COVID. And thereafter, we might discuss both what we would like the public interior to be and possible or likely directions it might be subject to. In my view, the public interior is an interior realm that citizens take to be public, in which they can appear to others as themselves in public. I must qualify this immediately as this appearance pertains to those who feel themselves enfranchised as citizens in every space. In the public interior, an agreement ah, is... Yeah. Sorry, sorry to stop you. We have a, a problem for sharing your screen. Could you... Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Now it's, no, no. now it's up screen, finally, I think. Okay, okay it's good. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, sorry for disturbing that. you. It's perfect. Is there no problem now? No, now it's working, yeah. Thank you. Can you Thanks see a picture of the National Theatre in Des Dennis Lass by Dennis yeah, Lassen? That's right. Perfect. Thanks. Oh, Sorry. Uh, okay. Where was I? Yes. Yes. In the public interior, an agreement is assumed, but not necessarily present between those that own the interior and those who use it. But the fact that such a space is taken to be public implies an order of freedom, which is in fact presented as an aura of freedom. Today, we might think of the public interior, one that we miss in our period of COVID-19 induced isolation as describing the station, the transportation hub, the museum, the theater, the library, the shopping center, even the office. These are all scenes for our gathering, our movements, our association, our appearance. Now, with the majority of these spaces either closed or accessible in a limited way, the matter of our appearance of our appearance is immaterial. Our appearance is dangerous. We do not appear. It becomes difficult to imagine how we might appear in the future. The distances we are obliged to maintain to keep ourselves and others safe from the pandemic are either, either imagined to remain in some form in the future or simply disappear and that things return to normal. This moment marks a pause in our consideration of the public interior, obliging us to ask what the public interior is and does and what we want it to be, how we desire our agency to be in the future. The public interior, as it first appears and as, as it has developed, has used an aura of freedom in order to impose degrees of coerced or controlled behavior for specific purposes through a range of appearances and organizational formats. In my book, The Public Interior as Idea and Project, I describe the public interior's uh, appearances and organizational formats as abiding by a set of themes in their proposition and design, namely the garden, the palace, the ruin, the shed, the machine, and the network. The realization having been that the public interior had either proposed itself in modernity as an elusive condition in which its imagery communicated certain fictions of engagements for its, for its user, or that the public interior proposed itself as a device or system 
whose organization conditioned its subjects' experience and relations. In both propositions, the public interior seemed to convey the intention of forming its subjects and their subjectivities, situating those subjects within specific relations of power. The public interior could be observed as offering the most concentrated scenes of power relations, leavened by fictions of freedom, enfranchisement, and agency. The public interior is not an isolated feature of the city. It has come to exist within a condition of interior, an ecology of agreements or impositions that are ideological or in the service of power, communicating power relations. In a system of laissez-faire, free market or neoliberalist capitalism, this condition is continuous, affecting all spaces of life, from the home to the spaces of production and consumption. The condition of interior pervades everything. Within the setting of capitalism, this condition is presented as natural, transparent, a free space offering freedom through a freedom to choose, a freedom to consume. The condition of interior is articulated most intensely in the public interior, regardless of building type. In my book, Without and Within, Essays on Territory and the Interior, I wrote about the development of a continuous interior and the relation between the imagining and claiming of territory, specifically in the American West, and the ensuing development of endless or continuous interior spaces, largely predicated on consumption, from the shopping mall to the airport and the museum. That interior was at first an imaginary ideological space, which through a system of appropriation, the conquest of land, the elimination of its indigenous population, its surveying, parceling, claiming, extraction of resources, mythification, acquisition of representational tropes and devices and patterns of occupation yielded building types and interior types that perfectly represented its fusion of control and illusory freedoms. This American version of a condition of interior echoed and refined the colonialist strategies of territorialization and urbanization practiced by Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, France and Britain, and, and I might as well include Belgium, my apologies. The setting out of settlements and land was intended to establish a projection of ideas of home over indigenous populations, rendering them subjects to another order, creating other conditions for their existence, drawing them to the body of the mother country or mother company. The specifically American version of this, which assumed a particular nature to the landowner, was a product of modernity, a rationalization beyond the measure of the body that could control other bodies at the expense of the bodies of the other. Thomas Jefferson's Land Ordinance, 1785, set out a system, a grid, which defined the survey of, its, of territory, its measure, its setting out, the division of land, the establishment of settlements, the internal organization of the settlement therein, and its institutions, the parceling of land and lot sizes within, and by extension, the measure of standard building materials. All of this set without having laid eyes on the land itself, and naturally without acknowledging the existence of those who lived there. The space of the continent became the continent's interior, managed by a federal department of the interior. In the 1860s, it became a space of exploration, a space of war, a space of conquest, a space of exploitation and extraction, a space of myth, and an apparently infinite space of embodied ideology. At this moment, the myth of the American space as an interior depended on images, those of Yosemite, for example, a space discovered 
by white European Americans was a Garden of Eden, proof of God's anointment of the American project, legitimating its claim upon the domain of the other, who it eliminated with vigor, and which through rhetoric, the doctrine of manifest destiny, transformed its ideological groundwork into a construction of so-called truths that justified all further exploitation and guaranteed a free space for the superior conquering white European settler. Eden, of course, is an interior, a walled garden, a hortus conclusis. A condition of interior furthermore informed the urban project, wherein homesteads, settlements and cities across the land, all marked by the imprint of the Jeffersonian grid and its promise of independence and self-realization secured through work, were further legitimated by the image of nature in, within the city. The urban parks of Frederick Law Olmsted, who had also advocated for Yosemite to be made a national park, reinforced the notion of the city being a blessed interior of a piece with the territory it dominated and economically exploited, and that that territory presented as an image was also part of this interior. In the United States, this is the idea that the public in interior inherited and ultimately expressed, this is a long and complex story and there are many abbreviations, through the form of the indoor shopping center, more commonly known as the mall. The first of these, the first indoor mall, the Southdale Center in Edina, Minnesota, developed and designed by Victor Gruen, was located at a key point within a network of motorways serving a large suburban region that connected them to the larger region and the city. The Southdale Center's imagery was a fusion of village square filtered through the lens of media and design and corporate lobby, as if to make the point that the sites of white collar work and white collar consumption were inexorably bound together. Oh, sorry. What's happened here? Something's happened. Um, um, we we still see your slides and your. We can still see the slides. I can't see my. Oh, yeah. slides. That's, that's my problem. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, um, no, this is very strange. No, now I can see the slides. Sorry about this. Fine, we're back. We're back. Um, so I was on to the next slide. Um, uh, yes, this is the idea. This is the um, um, Southdale Centre in, in its setting at the time of its construction. So work, dwelling and leisure, whether it was entertainment or consumption, were unified. In the words of the architect Kevin Roach, uh, sometime later, by the umbilical cord of the motorway uh, and um, telecommunication systems reinforcing the territory status as both ideological and experienced interior. The interior of the town square, which you saw earlier with benches, sculptures, fountains, projected safety. And this was reported, uh, this is by the way, the office of the um, Union Carbide or the lobby, of the Union Carbide building in New York, um, designed by Skidwell Orange and Merrill, I was making a point that the language, architectural language of the shopping mall was closely tied to the architectural language of the corporate headquarters. But I'll, I'll just go back to the town square if I can. Oop, no, no, I can't do that. Oh dear, 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 dear. Now it really is out of, um, sorry, I have to go back here. Right. Um, the interior of the town square with benches, sculptures, fountains, projected safety. This was reinforced by a proprietary uh, security team who would clear out undesirables. These were most often black and brown pe people and youth. The shaping of the public was a restriction on who could legitimate be, legitimately be treated as a subject. The space of the mall was for the use and edification of white 
blue and white collared workers. The town square, both, as I said before, both bore resemblance to the new office lobbies in urban downtowns, uh, drawing uh, both together in their representations of a coherent urban and social character. It is noteworthy that uh, this condition of interior emerges at the beginnings of modernity. Detached, as the architectural historian Leonardo Bonevolo remarked, from the direct experience or measure of the human body. Thomas Jefferson's land ordinance perfectly represents this turn from the body to operative system. The public interior, as we have come to imagine it here in Europe, also emerged in modernity, first as an ordered realm idealizing the street in the form of the passage, offering dream worlds to its users. The passage prefigured what would happen to Paris under the restructuring and rebuilding, or more, more precisely, urbanization of Louis Napoleon III and Baron Georges Eugène Haussmann, in which the city itself was rendered and ordered after considerable destruction, controlled uh, and equipped uh, an interior, a machine for forming urban subjects and subjectivities. The process, or the purpose rather, of urbanization, as defined by Idéphone Serda, was to at once rationalize urban organization, extend that organization of the whole territory, thereby producing a total urban condition and eliminating any distinction between city and countryside, and shaping its occupants as urban subjects, thereby producing subjects who conform or behave predictably. The public interior, as we've come to understand it, a space for urban masses, as opposed to the intimate dream worlds of individuals within the passage, is a space that has been forged within processes consistent with those rationalizations of the modern state. Its institutions and its representations, or more precisely, its displays. The Crystal Palace, designed for the Great Exhibition of 1851 in London by Joseph Paxman, the first universal exposition, was vast enough to contain thousands of visitors in time, and of course, famously, a mature tree standing in Hyde Park. It was a display of artifacts from all over the world with an emphasis on the spread, capacities, and power of the British Empire. The Crystal Palace, beyond displaying these artifacts and people, displayed power in an environment that promised transparency, access, and an image of the world, while hardly being there it's through its glass architecture. It offered a notion of freedom and elation at the immensity and accommodation of the imperial project itself. It is known that uh, Aristide Boussicot admired it and used it as inspiration for the construction of the Grand Magasin Aubemarché in Paris, designed by Boileau and Eiffel. Because of the universal accessibility to things, consumer goods apparently afforded by the deep, light-infused interior, an interior that suggested that it simply contained a portion of the world. Here, the public interior, like that of the Passage, is also a privately owned interior. It is the promise of freedom, in this case, again, freedom to consume, that makes it feel so, to be taken to be public by its users. The interior also suggested that it was a kind of palace, but in this case, one open to a truly general public, who were for the first time to see the prices of items openly shown. The public, positioned in relations in relation to artifacts so they might be purchased, were thereby transformed into consumers. We could say they were formed into consumers. The range of soi-disant public interiors of Paris returned to a singular morphology, whether market, train station, library, museum, or exhibition hall. The shed 
of cast iron and glass was favored by Louis Napoleon III as the image of the Parisian metropolis. All of these buildings, all these interiors reinforced the image of the public interior and of course each reinforced the identity of the metropolitan subject. The spectacle of the public interior could be seen at one with the uh, momentous changes to the fabric of the whole city of Paris and changes to the urban subject who the city was effectively creating, a working, producing, consuming subject. This change tied to the creation of wealth through industrialized powers, exploitations of colonies resources was reflected in the proliferation of universal exhibitions following on from the great ex exhibition of 1851. Paris had held a series of these up until 1937. And in the 19th century, these celebrated industry, technology and machines, which were displayed using the same methods, vast space, transparency, abundance, spectacle. The great iron and glass shed was the predominant figure of the Exposition Universelle, held many times in Paris, particularly in the latter half of the 19th century. The structural engineering of the spaces was spectacular, but so too was the arrangement of artifacts, notably industrial machinery. The spaces of the exhibitions were intentionally overwhelming. They also shared a kinship with the new spaces that represented the metropolitan aspect of the city, ones I've discussed before. Elsewhere, the public interior, as exemplified perhaps by the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele II in Milan, seemed to be an environment that resembled the city itself, yet sustained under glass like some exotic plant. An ideal street, a hypertrophied passage, with, which assured its users the citizens of Milan, that despite the ruptures between an industrialized present and an artisanal past, that their most public space was at the center of the world. The public interior here and in Paris offered fictions or even fantasies for citizens to engage and identify with. These too formed the urban subject. When one looks at the history of the public interior, one sees that it has frequently communicated in order to inculcate. It has overdetermined in order to affect behaviors and agreement. For most of its history, it has traded in promises of freedom, enfranchisement and self-realization. That history has demonstrated that the public interior has been a space of control, a space of ideology a space that reinforces power relations or of the representation of ideas or pretenses that sustain that dominant ideology. It has, as a consequence, been readily susceptible to programs of capital capitalism. Within, values are established and a form of contract is assented to between user and owner, in which the owner sets the terms, determines the representational schema, the worldview. Within the framework of capitalism, there is endless capacity for accommodation and disruptive elements are often in the end absorbed if they can prove to be financially exploitable. There is an extraction logic to the spaces of capitalism in which the public interior is the supreme representative. The paradigmatic public interior, whether we like it or not, is the shopping mall devised at the height of American post-war capitalism, a collaboration of state and industry. Having developed on from the fusion of Passage and Grand Magasin, the latter deriving from the colonialist, colonialist propaganda of the great exhibitions and Exposition Universelle's crystal palaces and their spectacles of extraction and exploitation. The mall is complemented by or continuous with the corporate lobby, as I said before, and of course the lobby and the mall are found to be fused in the museum and in the transport hub alike. 
We are faced with a condition now in which the diffusion of consumer contact with both online vendors and technology empires, and this very much deriving from the work of Shoshana Zubov, extends the reach of the market, the extraction of information which perpetuates control. One can imagine a great clamor to maximize this extraction of information now from those companies that benefit from its monetization. In other words, in the absence of peop real people in real spaces, there is always ways to make their money from them digitally. There is a danger in that enthusiasm or the enthusiasm around smart cities, which are of course the, the love children of, uh, of, of Google and the like, will, you, will yield even more control to those technology interests who can make everything easier. easier. Uh, Google, perhaps the most prominent among them, their Hudson Yard development in New York and canceled sideway, sidewalk project in Toronto, offering models as to what one might expect of the future of the public interior. When companies such as these make themselves indispensable to municipal authorities who cannot afford to control the various forces in play in the city or form the policies to control them, then one sees a very serious erosion of the idea of the public sphere, the public interior, and for that matter, democracy itself. COVID-19 measures have served to put a pause on the use of the public interior, its aura, and our contact with it. In the space of appearance of Hannah Arendt, we do not appear. Instead, the public interior has temporarily become a pariah space with few people, most attempting to maintain their distance, using it only as they strictly need. Retail facilities, which tend to dominate experience or serve as its omnipresent white noise, are largely closed or operating on diminished schedules. The relative absence of this activity would seem to recall an earlier, simpler time. You remember, you may remember a variety of anachronisms as soon as the first shutdown took hold. With fewer to no airline flights came quiet skies, clean skies. One could listen to birdsong. So after the pause, what may come? There is an assumption that COVID-19 has broken all patterns and that nothing will be the same again. It may well indeed be different. Many commercial concerns have been put out of business. Security measures will probably remain in either aggressive or vestigial forms long after the pandemic has been suppressed. What might happen if the abundance of determining conditions is redirected or profoundly altered and that true engagement and agency was in fact possible. Now, this is not an unlikely scenario. One notes that many commercial interests, particularly in the catering and retail industries, have been badly affected by the damage caused by the economy, by to the economy by coronavirus and measures taken to slow its spread. Chains of stores with thousands of employees from coffee to clothing have closed many outlets with the fear that their brands and their market presence may never fully recover. The public purse has been drawn upon to set up furlough schemes, prop up businesses and in some industries and pay for provision for medical equipment, care, hospital beds and tracking and tracing systems. In addition, money has been squandered and corruption, or at least incompetence, have been rife. People have, through it all, suffered enormously and have learned through their struggles to sustain themselves differently. They have learned to become more self-reliant, cautious and independent. They have learned to value different things in the absence of consumption of commodities, their families, reading, cooking, making. They become conscious of the value of links between generations. They yearn, nevertheless, for movement, association and action. What might people demand or welcome as they find themselves to be more self-determining subjects? Flaneur all over again. Post-COVID, 
a moment which may be some time off yet, one year, two years, people will gather again, mingle, consume, travel, behave badly. Perhaps familiar patterns will be altered, but what is notable is that after earlier understandings that the natural environment might benefit from the shutdown to airline travel and consumer activity, financial packages from government to individuals in industry tend to promise a kind of revival of the way things were pre-COVID. With economies ambitions restored to levels of growth that become expected or demanded, a return to normal has been central to policy rather than the use of this period of pause and disruption as a time to completely reappraise environmental and economic policy. There is, disappointingly from our governments, a narrative of reset, reinstating neoliberal precepts of unsustainable growth. So this is a moment for complete reappraisal. Yet core aspects to ideas wherein the city is treated as a capital information producing resource, as opposed to an environment for people, continue. They persist. We continue to develop, to develop enthusiastically workshops on smart cities, whose offer of technological solutions to problems seems to serve the interests of tech industries that profit from mining information on human interaction, behavior and feelings, rather than the well-being of citizens. This seems to be a profit motivated address to problems that may be better addressed by holistic attitudes to urban economies and environments. When we speak of the post COVID public interior, we have the opportunity to think about what we desire. Distinct from notions imposed on the public interior concerning our behavior or performance or patterns of consumption or production of information, the mining of data, our personalities. We might begin by considering who we are, a rather more expansive idea, I hope that, and who has not been included in the social contract to date. How might they be included and how might they and all of us be served by the public interior? What kind of public interior would benefit all of us, would enfranchise all of us, the citizens of our societies? How might the public interior serve our health, our legitimacy, our humanity, our empathy and relations to others? How might the public interior serve our sense of being in the world, our sense of the natural world, how might our public interiors allow us to ask how we might exist with others, with other living creatures and organisms in a world in which we are, of necessity at this stage, not the most important of them? We all might consider other futures, imagine other paradigms. And here I want to turn to the part that can be played by architects, being one myself, but it could be others involved in the making of the city who advance an enhanced notion of responsibility and agency. You will know the examples I'll show probably already, but they seem to have anticipated the need for other paradigms. The examples are representative of what we might aspire to make. In the public interior as we desire it to be, we hold on to the notion that we should have some kind of real freedom, that we should have agency. And there are other models from the past in which possibilities of agency or other affordances that we might see as positive present themselves. For example, the Maison du Peuple uh, of Horta in Brussels, or of Lord's Baudouin, Baudiansky and Prouvé in Clichy, which are were both strangely bound to the imagery of the metropolis and the factory. The public agoras of Van Klingere in Dronte and Eindhoven. The enfranchising institutions of Lino Bobardi in Sao Paulo and other public interiors that do not fit the capitalist or neoliberal paradigm, which we continue to see as the norm. The treatments of these other public interiors offer us lessons in that they propose resistant models 
in the face of a prevalent condition of spectacle and consumerism in which civic infrastructures and culture marketed as spectacle are increasingly transformed into vehicles for the exploitation of captive consumers from airports to train stations. So the first two examples, our first examples are two projects by Frank von Klinger, De Meerpaal in Dronte, which I show here, and at Karachat in Eindhoven. Each imagines an interior shared by a local community with modest common facilities. In the first instance, these are a theatre, some spaces for light sport, market, restaurant, a bar, a place to watch television projected on a screen. This is a kind of fun palace, the Cedric Price's project in 1957, with none of the rhetoric of cybernetics or choice. In the second instance, the public interior becomes the meeting place surrounded by essential community agents. The doctor's surgery, the nursery school, an elementary school, offices for small businesses, the local supermarket. Under one roof, a landscape of meeting and engagement. This engagement was very real and naturally suffered from the very real issues that arise between people. A self-balancing system that did not work, that required less interiority, perhaps, and more being in the world. It still remains an inspiring example. Three of Lino Bobardi's project in Sao Paulo also served as kinds of models. The Museum of Modern Art, or otherwise known as MASP, uh, particularly the space covered by the art gallery suspended above it, offered a free space for citizens, naturally including those who had no particular interest in modern art. The space was a gift with material and proportional qualities that sheltered citizens, that accommodated them, their actions and events, all while situating them in and above the city. Uh, Cesc Fabrica de Pompeo was a former factory whose meaning was utterly transformed by its conversion to a, into a local cultural and social centre with facilities for gathering, study, crafts, art, and through theatre, sport and leisure, and, uh, and its disruption of the integrity of the factory space, play. Its programme, which was curated by Obari herself, promoted the natural desired state of citizens in opposition to their alienating labor. Bobardi's Teatro Oficina could be described as an occupation of an existing space, its long proportions transformed into a kind of street theater through the addition of galleries made of scaffolding, drawing performers and audiences into one relationship. It is also incomplete, a large window onto an adjacent empty lot providing an opportunity to grow plants, to accept anomaly and accident. The accidental public interior, encouraging appropriation and uses that could be described as misuse, was central to the success of the ruined spaces of the Palace de Republique in Berlin after the collapse of East Germany and after the building had been stripped of asbestos and all its representative fittings. The ruin, the space voided of intention, became a space of play and imagination. The Stadtsaal, Markthal in Ghent, is an interior, or simply a shelter, under one, which, un, uh, one under which citizens can talk, gather, meet, stay warm, and see themselves as citizens together, looking out to the city and all around them. There are no pressures to do anything else in this public interior, in this urban hall. The public interior, as we might imagine it, not, need not necessarily be inside. By being within the spaces of our urbanized environment, our spaces are already held within a condition of interior. What they can do within this condition is witness it. Citizens in the public interior may not only see each other, engage with each other, or be alone amongst others, they may also think about their place in the world or simply revel in it. In the swimming pool designed by Alvaro Siza for the municipal park in Matosinhos, Lace de Palmira, this park called Quinta de Contessao, people of all ages find themselves at play among the trees. They are somewhere, 
not alone, not subject to any determinations other than being creatures among other creatures in the world. After the pandemic, we should allow the public interior, indoors or out, to be free from exploitation, from the conditioning of subjectivities, from the obligation to consumption, from the extraction of personal data. We should allow it to be free. Here around the Acropolis in Athens, Dimitris Picionis designed a series of pathways using discarded material, spolia, and humble paving to make a specific ground upon which one might be conscious of the rhythms of one's own body, the lay of the land, and the occasional presence of the Acropolis itself, and therefore time, of others, trees, of birds, the sky, of one's place in the world. This too might be a model. We might therefore welcome the public interior as a place where individuals can be alone in public with their own thoughts. Here in London, in a square of my own design, individuals can look down and read the names of other places or hear voices from other places and for a moment transport themselves there or to some place in their minds where that place resides. Being in the world is, uh, is being at once here and elsewhere with everyone. Thank you very much. Ooh, sharing is right. Hi, can you see me? Hi, Mark. I can see you, which is which is positive. <laughs> Thank you so much for the, this presentation. Um, I guess uh, Geoffrey and I have uh, some questions. A couple of questions. We don't want to be uh, too long on that, but um, maybe we can start the discussion and then hopefully our uh, Audience will join in and, uh, and uh, submit uh, some uh, some questions or comments, and uh, please do do not hesitate to do so and, uh, and join the, the discussion. So maybe Geoffrey, if you want to, to start yeah, with a yeah, question, with yeah. pleasure. Uh, maybe uh, thanks a lot uh, for your talk, Mark. Very interesting. Um, maybe I, I have a, a general question concerning the the narration of your of your talk. In your first part, you emphasized more, I would say. Um, public interior that are built by the state or by, uh, let's say, uh, corporations, let's say, mm -hmm. where, let's say, it, it emphasized, let's say, control over citizens, over, let's say, in a way, in a way you suggested as well that urbanization as such is a way of building interior or ways that are, yes. uh, let's say, our urban condition again controlled by the states, by uh, uh, capitalism, we could say, and so on. And in the second part, you emphasize more, I would say, emancipatory pub, uh, public interior. So from you show example from the 50s, the 60s, I mm -hmm. think showing how they would allow to emancipate, let's say, local population. So you, you, you really ended with a, a very positive note of how uh, in the post-COVID we can get back our freedom, let's say, our... Uh, um, but so, so do you think that... Uh, and of course, as a Metrolab, we have been always interested in social infrastructure as a emancipatory tools, and so as a, as a tools of uh, building collectivity or building, let's say, communities. So, have you seen, you have shown a few examples of architect, most of the time architects were, let's say, um, engaged with the state or with, with corporations in, say, in building this uh, control uh, public interior. Do you think that uh, there are very good examples like, like you've shown Lino Dobardi, for example, building, let's say, public interior for the community, but have you seen 
some example of, of architect and designer engaging beyond in really uh, building, let's say, with or co-designing with citizen, with community, uh, public interiors. Yes. Um, I think we we are probably seeing this to agree to a degree now. I can't I can't give you too many um, concrete examples of of co-design being um, the the path, um, but it is true that the the architects that I highlighted as being um, resistant to the status quo, which is more or less the construction of a well working um, capitalist economy. Um, uh, and liberal state uh, were architects who were politically engaged, who disagreed with uh, the perpetuation of this model. And um, they used their architectural knowledge, and I think this is very, very important, to create, um, to create environments whose language would in themselves communicate notions of a different order of freedom or play, for example, to the to their users. I, it's it's to be noted that that the architects designed these spaces. Um, uh, even in undesigning them, they in the case of Bobardi and the and the and the and the Sesc Fabrica Pompeia, there is there is still uh, design involved. Um, I, I, I see absolutely no reason why politically engaged um, uh, architects or other activists uh, and communities should not be able to come together and produce spaces which resist um, resist the the standard way of doing things. The thing about the public interior, of course, is that it's usually proposed at a scale in our experience, which has to do with many serving many, many people when was serving people who are not necessarily within strictly within local communities. The case of Dronte and Eindhoven, for example, those two Frank von Klinger projects were in relatively small settlements. Dronte being a small, you know, kind of new town. Uh, Eindhoven, oops, you disappeared. Eindhoven being, um, 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 it was a suburb in Eindhoven. So, you know, very, very particular local communities. Uh, Sesc uh, Fabri Pompeia, of course, a slightly larger community surrounding uh, that factory, former workers with really the first uh, um, users of this space. But when we look at uh, examples such as um, as um, the MASP or the Stadtsau Marktal, an assumption is made that we have actually don't know who the users are, that they are the public, that they are all kinds of different public, that they're not necessarily associated with a community, that in fact community in itself as a word suggests that there are people who are outside the community. I think they're uh, extremely generous in the fact that they assume that anyone can use them and anyone can be themselves using them. So uh, I suppose in an advocacy for advocacy for a future time, I think I rather than necessarily uh, exclusively supporting uh, local um, co-building projects. One would want to pressure uh, the uh, owners of common land or what we would like to think of as common land into actually ensuring that it has some qualities. Uh, I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, in Den Haag, and there's actually very little public space which is not dedicated to moving people around infrastructure. Um, there are exceptions, of course, and those spaces are very beautiful and they work very well at gathering people together. But largely, when opportunities pre to present themselves to make spaces for people which are not necessarily, um, which shouldn't necessarily be um, uh, directive, those spaces tend to be um, offered a, as kinds of infrastructures indeed, not necessarily social infrastructures, just moving people along, getting things to work, getting things to work in ways which don't allow those spaces to be problematic. Um, and I'll just, um, as though a kind of uh, confirmation of this lack of publicness to these spaces, um, I was involved in the, the climate uh, 
the, the climate change rally last year in in um, in Den Haag, and it was notable that you couldn't get anywhere near any real public space in the city because the police kept, you know, kept you back, you know, armed and, uh, you know, very, very uh, armored uh, police. And that the space of public representation, the space of public appearance was not a space to appear in. It was not, uh, you know, not for that kind of thing. And um, I mean, it struck me at the time as being, well, you can understand that politicians didn't want to be um, had things thrown at them, but this was an incredibly peaceful march. This was just about a lack of representation. And and I, and I've, I, I, getting back to my answer, it 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 would it would um, please me far better if what we think of as the the public realm, the streets and the spaces that could be made public are made public, uh, attending to their qualities rather than allowing them to be simply spaces for um, opportunities for consumption. I hope that answered your question. Rather long-winded answer. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I think I have another one for you. Um, well, it's, uh, it's a question about one of uh, the categories that you've uh, described and uh, and that you um, deal with in your book on the public interiors. Um, this is the, the category of the shed. Uh, and you showed us uh, some, uh, some examples in your presentation. Mm. So, um, you know, f first, I, I would like to maybe to to give you uh, some uh, elements of, of of context about the situation here, here in Brussels. But um, during the, I guess maybe it's similar to, to what you uh, experience uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, if you're in the Netherlands, I don't know. Um, but uh, during the first uh, lockdown, you know, the month of uh, March to May or June, um, we. Of course, we were limited, you know, in our, in our freedom, but we also rediscovered the virtues of large, open, urban spaces, uh, uh, such as our uh, interior forest uh, in Brussels, the Bois de la Cambre, and you know, we, we just spent afternoons with our kids uh, uh, riding our bikes or uh, skateboards or whatever, um, and uh, having nice walks in the in the forest and so on. So. We rediscovered this, uh, this this virtue of the of the open uh, urban uh, green spaces and large open spaces, but then with this uh, second uh, lockdown, we're starting to miss our uh, public interiors, uh, our venues, um, and not only the the large ones because you, you showed us a lot of you know sort of mega. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, public interiors, but also our small. Uh, Collective interior, if not public, maybe community uh, interiors. Uh, I miss my uh, neighborhood uh, cafe. Uh, you know, this, these are small places that host a certain mini public, so so to speak. Um, and so, of course, there is a, a necessity to re, uh, uh, re to find these places again and to and to and to consider their their, their importance and significance for the for for, for the urbanites. Um, and uh, you know, it's I guess it has to do with the fact that we don't only need to uh, to move around to circulate, uh, even with our bikes or uh, or um, walking around in the city, but we also need places to stay put and, and and to develop activities. And for that, we need specific places that protect us uh, from from the rain in, in Brussels, for instance. <laughs> But uh, for, from different uh, of, um, perturbations or uh, to, to these activities, yes. and you were talking about maybe new paradigms for uh, public places in the post-COVID city, and I believe that these uh, places that are uh, hybrid in a way that are not totally closed but not totally open, such as the, the, the large sheds. Uh, the large urban sheds like the, the covered markets uh, in Brussels, I'm thinking uh, of the site of Les Abattoirs d'Anderlecht or other ones, these, these large sheds and shelters may have the capacity to become maybe, I don't know, one of these um, paradigmatic uh, public places for the future because they can uh, um, protect us from uh, and protect our activities in a certain way, but uh, 
at the same time, they also allow uh, ventilation and, and uh, the possibilities to uh, host uh, a large public in conditions that wouldn't be too uh, too dangerous uh, uh, regarding the, the, the danger of uh, uh, of contagion. So um, I don't I don't know. I, I guess we don't we don't have to uh, focus uh, uh, strictly on the on the contagion aspects, but I guess it will remain uh, relevant in the future, not only for this pandemic, but maybe for other uh, uh, hard uh, times. So, uh, I, as you are a specialist of this uh, shed, of this uh, architectural form, I'm a sociologist, so I don't know um, a lot about it, but I guess that there is a, a very intriguing um, quality that is proper to this, uh, to this form, uh, and that could be uh, useful or, or one of the solutions to uh, keep uh, you know, having uh, hopes for larger, uh, uh, for places, uh, urban spaces that have the capacity to, to host people and to, to, to get them together. Well, I, I agree completely. Um, I, I think the shed is an extremely potent form well, because, it, first of all, it has a long history from market halls onwards. Uh, where and, and a place where people from uh, from the city and the country, well, this town and the countryside would would meet. You know, it was a, a meeting place for others. Uh, exchange was uh, was key, but there was uh, all sorts of byproducts of it, which were you know strangers meeting, and this is rather important. It's also um, it tends to be the shed in its uh, past tends to have no kind of obviously representative representational characteristics. Which may mean that it is free of the the kind of um, the loaded quality that other building uh, types have. Which uh, just behind your head, I can draw the thoughts that the Opera de Paris or some some other other uh, 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 theatre where where these uh, where these decorations imply a certain or suggest a certain form of behaviour or or um, deportment among people. So in a sense that uh, that lack of specificity allows people to um, to get on with what they're doing. I, I also think that it's uh, worthwhile noting that, you know, in the in the history of uh, architecture, particularly modernist architecture, the shed or the large scale, large span structure becomes increasingly thought of as as a kind of democratic space, uh, one where you know movement is very free, uh, one where representation is absent and um, one which can increasingly be uh, free of structure. Um, so, you know, it starts to resemble more and more a kind of idealized world. So I, 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 um, I am I'm fascinated by the by the motif. Uh, the theme, the idea, and I'm fascinated by the fact that it's uh, it had it has been reiterated so frequently. Uh, I uh, so you know a, a sheltered public space, which is suddenly turned into a market one day a week, or you know something else, is uh, is, is very exciting. And indeed, in, in Brussels, I'm thinking of the, the abattoir and, and uh, its possibility of being used as all sorts of things. Former abattoir, no longer used as an abattoir. Um, um, it's that motif, for example, which uh, Tony Garnier um, used in Neon uh, in this, an exhibition building, which was, uh, I think, modeled on a, a, an abattoir of his earlier design for an ideal uh, industrial city, which then becomes a sheltered space, which is used for exhibitions and now for concerts and political meetings and all sorts of things. So uh, that's on a, a monster scale, but you can imagine just the shelter, the ATQ, the the, um, the pavilion, all being kind of um, rather potent iterations of this type. And um, yes, lovely. All right, thank you. So now we will, uh, if, if, if that's okay for you, we will take some questions from the from the audience, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So maybe you can read them uh, in the chat section. I don't know if you see these questions. Uh, I see one question, I see one chat thing. Um, so uh, would you like to select yourself the questions you want to answer? Oh, well, that's a lot of things to read here. Hold on just a second. Uh, you can read, no, I don't, I don't see any questions. That's okay. <laughs> We're going to, to read them uh, you, you, you'll, you'll, have to, you'll have to help me here because uh, I can't I can't read them for some reason. So yeah. if someone yeah. would like to read them for me, I'll be happy to. Yeah. Or the member of the audience could just, you know. 
they, they, they cannot talk at all. So this is another uh, controlled environment, and the people in the, in the audience are uh, muted. So, you know, we're we're in this. Uh, okay. We are in an interior. Uh, the control uh, tower uh, using control. Uh, interior. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so, um, can I read one of the questions? Yeah. Or uh, Louise one, maybe? Or? Yeah. Well, okay, so we have a question from Louise. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Luis says, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is about the link between public interiors and adjacent outdoor public spaces. Mm. What do you observe, think about their different qualities and their relationship? You mentioned outdoor public interiors. What's their difference with public spaces in this case? So I guess this is uh, very close to what we, we, we just talked about, right? This is the question. Yes, but there, there's a really uh, interesting Subtle difference. Well, first of all, I, I believe parks are an extraordinarily important outlet for citizens in the city. We all know that. You know, we can, we can, we can play there. Uh, we can contemplate things there. We have some sort of contact with something that resembles nature. Uh, and uh, in the best parks, in my view, there's always a consciousness of the city uh, and the art uh, around it and the artificiality of the park itself. Um, I mentioned in the lecture uh, Frederick Law Olmsted and his design for Central Park, and he designed all sorts of parks in North America, urban parks, which were meant to be, on the one hand, a bits of natural infrastructure for the city so that there could be a movement of nature and air and animals even. Uh, uh, water management was very much part of his, uh, his notion of the use of these parks. But another role that they played was that they were representations of the American territory, and uh, which was incredibly important for justifying the, and justifying the American urban project entirely. Central Park, um, uh, which is uh, designed to feel like in many instances, like a fragment of the original nature of Manhattan, but of course it's artificial, um, is really interesting, as you know, because when you're there, you always have this image of the city looking at you from the edges. And of course, the park itself served as a fantastic real estate engine for all those properties around its edges. Um, you know, it, it made the city more valuable. Uh, I, I guess in answer to your question, um, maybe it's not an answer to your question, Louise, I'm very, very sorry if it, it, it isn't, but it seems to me that um, in such spaces, you're always aware of the city as a kind of interior and you're always kind of held within it. Um, there are only the wilder stretches of, you know, Hampstead Heath, for example, in London, where you may forget that you're actually in London. But this uh, kind of uh, sense of inside and the protection of the city is is part of its charm and the way it works, in fact. Um, how is it distinct from a d distinct public interior? Well, you know, it's uh, uh, you're, you're not covered. Um, you have different modes of behavior, I think, just consciously pulling yourself together in different ways because you're more, uh, you feel as if you are with other people more. Um, I mean, these are qualities of subjectivity. But I, I, Louise, I'm I'm sure that was a terrible answer. <laughs> well, I, I can't hear you now. Oh, you've got Sorry. your your the mic was off. I put the mic on. Yeah, I'm, I was saying that actually we have two questions concerning the relation of uh, public interior and architecture to the neoliberal ideology. So I can read the key part maybe of it. The first one by Carolina uh, ask if uh, I read it. Uh, Given the architecture production process and representation of power, can architecture really be free of the neoliberal ideology? And maybe I go to the second one that is very close. Mm -hmm. uh, by an anonymous, so I can't tell you the name of the person, but um, I go. Do you believe that with public assistance, some part of the private real estate stock could be reclaimed with the intent to enlarge the presence of this different order of freedom the public interior you talk about should provide? Mm -hmm. In other words, do you think this new freedom 
can be achieved while working with the tenets of the neoliberal doctrine? And this second question was actually suggesting to use, uh, uh, let's say, private assets in order to extend the public, uh, let's say, uh, interiors. Well, first of all, um, I think it is possible to for architects to work outside uh, the uh, neoliberal strictures, uh, the, the or, um, and with outside the neoliberal economy. I think um, you, as architects, like anybody else, you have to choose who you work with, and um, and choose who you serve. And um, I, I think that it's uh, really important to make that point. Uh, that um, the question of uh, how one is as an agent within society is is something you really uh, think of. Um, we have to, in that context, be very cautious about uh, who we establish partnerships with, in order to to create this basis that we want to to make. And um, I br brought up the um, the issue of um, of Google and the Sidewalk Labs project before in Toronto, which was offered to the city as a kind of solution for uh, a development problem that the city had at its waterfront. And they came across as being incredibly benign uh, that, you know, we'll, don't worry, we'll handle these things for you, you know, security, don't worry, you know, and everything will work because we'll have access to everybody's information. So everything, you know, it will be a smart city and it will work. And um, in a sense, the proposition was a, a kind of coal mine for uh, for data retrieval, uh, which would, of course, enhance uh, Google through its um, alphabet um, development arm, um, would allow it to earn lots and lots of money and would allow it to effectively be the rulers of this environment. Now, um, that's a case of a city thinking that, that actually just help from business is a good thing. They just got help from the wrong business. So I think it's searching for partners who are genuinely dedicated to the, um, the health of our society and its citizens. And I mean that in the broadest possible way without some sort of uh, return, because that is, that's the key aspect of the capitalist project. We'll make money out of this. Um, this is something that has to, be, has to be looked at. Or if they're making money, how is that money returned into the system? Is it possible to make a kind of circular economy with it? I think, so uh, right now in, in Amsterdam, and I believe Brussels is doing this too, the, the kind of donut economic model is being adopted where um, the benefits to citizens and the environment are being prioritized and the well-being and happiness of citizens is being prioritized over uh, economic growth uh, or, um, you know, all the damages that, that, that come with it, the social and, and environmental damages that come with it. So, and this is a question for that to work important partnerships have to be established, which are um, uh, uh, friendly and not obsessed with uh, uh, profit or, um, you know, including in, 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 in contributing to the wealth of shareholders. So um, I, ho I hope that kind of broadly answers your, your questions. Um, it's, it's all possible. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I think uh, it's uh, it will be a good moment to to conclude. Actually, um, we reviewed most of the questions from uh, from from our audience. We had other uh, questions that were similar to the to the one you just answered uh, right now. So, um, uh, well, thank you all for uh, participating or for uh, listening and and being attentive to this session, but also to our uh, webinar in general. So. Uh, uh, we were so pleased to have you, Mark, uh, today again. Um, next uh, session uh, will take place on uh, December 15. Uh, again, it will be a Tuesday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. Uh, and we will hear uh, our colleague uh, Maria Chiara Tozzi, uh, who is the co-author of, um, of a book entitled uh, Welfare Spaces. And our talk 
on uh, December of 15 will be entitled Welfare Space as Social Infrastructure. So uh, this will be a talk from uh, an urban planner and an architect. And then we will have more talk, talks to come um, uh, in uh, January. So, uh, well, uh, it was very, very interesting. We will um, edit and uh, upload the, the, the video of uh, Mark's talk and maybe for our discussion, if you're, if you're okay with that, Mark. Uh, yes. We will use the, the video uh, on uh, Metro Lab's uh, YouTube channel soon enough. Uh, please, uh, um, um, yes. uh, please send me a, a link to that. Oh, yes, we will. So be sure we will uh, send you the link to that and we will also uh, uh, circulate the information to our, to our audience. So, uh, well, that's, uh, that's all for me. Um, I hope uh, it, it was uh, also maybe interesting for you, Mark, but we were uh, uh, really uh, interested to have you and to uh, um, consider the, the relevance of your work for the, for the ongoing situation and uh, we'll make sure to to read uh, your your books as uh, they can, I, I, I believe, uh, give some uh, some keys uh, to enlighten the, the, the current situation and, and challenges we're facing. So I'm just showing to the, the camera one of your books, uh, uh, the very fascinating uh, Without and Within, um, and I don't have the, the public interior book. The public here. interior is currently uh, out of print, but it will, there yeah. will be a second printing. Right. Well, I, I have one copy. I hope I, I still have one uh, at home. Yes, um, awesome. All right, so Geoffrey, you want to, to say something? Maybe just goodbye? <laughs> yeah, yeah, goodbye. Thanks again to Mark and thanks to everybody for uh, being there. And we hope to see you again on the 15th of December for hearing Maria Chiara Tosi. It will be very different because it will be more connected to the context of the Città Diffusa, so a very, so how, uh, let's say, welfare space developed into that context, but mm -hmm. for sure a very interesting complement to, to Mark's talk of today. Thanks again, Mark, and thanks for everybody. Thank you very much again. It was a an honor and pleasure to do this. All right.